So, these magazines, okay, we have to be very careful. There's a lot to learn about them. The first thing is, and that's got a roll of film already in it. The first thing about magazines is that there's a very delicate rubber light trap which runs around the magazine. That we must always protect. We must never trap a finger or anything when we close it and it has to be closed gently. A roll of negative, okay, this is a roll of negative. When it comes from the manufacturer, it's in a tin. Inside the tin, there's a black envelope, like a, a paper bag, which is light tight. There's a double seal. It will come taped over. There's a piece of tape just over the end here. You have to take that out in total darkness. Where's the puffer brush? We always puff out our magazine, give it a good puff out to, just to dislodge dust because we don't want dust. Thank you. You have to do this by feel, you cannot look. You place the, the roll of film, this is 400 feet, these will take a thousand feet which will fill that container down, turn until it clicks. There's a little um, lever that goes into the little notch there, the little keyway, and secures it. Then, by feel, this goes through a slot there, out, and back into a slot just there. Now, like so. We now need what's known as a core. And this does not have a core in it, which it should have. Okay, so can we go and find one of those cores? They should be back there. The idea is you put the film in the core. There's two ways to do it. The easy and safe way is to make a little hook, like I've just done. Push it down with your finger and go round. The other way, which is in a sense more correct, is to do it this way. Pop that in like that and go round and you need to pull out enough film to go round several times so that it doesn't fall off the core. You can even put a little bit of camera tape over the end of the film to secure it onto the core. If you do that, you've got to do this without looking in the dark now, the thing is, how do I know whether it's that way round or that way round? This has to be done by feel. These are what's known as a 9P load. If you imagine that roll of film as a big letter 9, and you imagine this roll of film as a big letter P. So if that's the big letter P, and we go round like this, Okay. That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Just remember, 9 on the feed, P on the take-up. That's the feed side, this is the take-up side. You just have to get it right. And there are diagrams in the movie cam manual which tell you all about doing this. Put it on, rotate until it locks. Okay. Now, we need a little loop poking out there. So if I just pull out a few inches of film and leave it as a loop, it's now all set. But you can see the danger is that it comes off a bit. If you put a little bit of tape on there, that it can't be a problem. Then you gently close the magazine, reach underneath and lock it with the latches. You need your little loop of film in order to load the camera. So that is now a loaded magazine. There's another thing with the 1,000 feet magazines that I'll show you. 
so I can expose that part of film. Yeah, it's waste. You see this? That is a spring-loaded manual footage counter. Normally, we have it out of the way there because we've got a better electronic one in the camera. But these magazines do have that facility as well. Lock, then we're secure. Okay, <laughs> here we are with the camera. To take the handle off, push down the locking button, pivot that, and then the whole thing will release. Smaller than Pop that in there. Smaller than Right. Open here. And it's quite a complicated movement. So we're going to show you how to load a roll of film. Let's get the power cable. Let's get the power cable. It's a yellow cable. One. So that end of the battery is up to the Okay. This end goes into the power socket, which is just here. Okay, and we'll actually provide power to the camera. Open. Open. The, this is the movement, the expensive bit of the camera, and it hasn't changed in an awful long time. So, if I pull that back, the movement will retract and enable me to put the film in the gate. It might be interesting to actually look at the camera gate, because that's actually quite an interesting piece of mechanism. Here, I have something called the back pressure plate. This actually keeps the film flat against the aperture plate very accurately so that it doesn't wander and get a varying uh, exposure. So that mounts just in there. And locks in place like so. It's spring loaded. This is the actual gate of the camera and it's very accurately polished stainless steel. That's the actual aperture. Now that one is the full su Super 35 aperture. That's your actual gate. When they say check the gate they mean check that there's no dust. If I have a little puffer brush we could puff that to make sure and also we're going to puff out our camera body little particles of emulsion can come off the last reel and collect in there there's like a V at the bottom there that goes on a mounting rail in the body and it's quite tricky so what I'm going to have to do Pop him back in. There. To make sure, close, crank over once and open. So I've now put the uh, top aperture plate back in the camera. The magazine here. We need a loop of film like so, sticking out of the magazine. That, first of all, let's get the magazine the right way up. There. We feed through that hole, okay, and pull out to one side. Like so. Then very gently place the magazine down onto the bottom bar there and lock in place only when we pull that lever across is the magazine safe that is now safely locked on and won't come off now to load the magazine to load the film in the camera open 
open. What we have to do is follow the actual lacing path, which is, as I'm going to demonstrate, I'll explain it to you in a minute. Those are sprocket wheels, top and, top and bottom. And the purpose of the sprocket wheel, obviously, is to engage the film perforations and move it through the camera. Feed, sprocket, take up sprocket. The path for lacing is out of the magazine, under this sprocket, always under, up over this little um, guide, under that bar, up, through the gate, that's the gate, and then over the top of the take-up sprocket. When you've done it, make sure the perforations, the holes in the film, engage properly with the teeth of the sprocket wheels. Then we can close the sprocket wheel guides and they will hold the film on the teeth. To adjust our loop size, we push the gear wheel the sprocket wheel, feed film through, release. That disengages the drive on this sprocket and enables us to adjust the size of our film loops. The normal expectation is that you must have a loop top and bottom. If you don't, the film might tear. There's a little dot on this wheel. For loading, we have to put that into the loading position by rotating in the direction of the arrow. Mm -hmm. The little dot is pointing to the little arrow, so it's fine. I've now got to engage the movement, which is a set of claws, through the teeth of the film so that the film is accurately registered. To do that, I oscillate this knob backwards and forwards and you might be able to just see here the teeth, mm -hmm. the claw teeth moving up and down. You might just be able to get that. Mm -hmm. What I do is I keep oscillating and then I come over until the teeth go through the perforations in the film and accurately register it. I return my dot to the upright position, check I've got loops top and bottom. I now want to see if it's a jam or whether I've got a correct load. To do that, I'm just going to gently turn that through one revolution. And it's okay. I haven't jammed the film. So that's fine. Now, what I'm going to do is turn that to the loop position, so the dot is on the loop arrow. Engage the motor by flicking that little buckle switch, is what it's called, into the upright position. Now, we've taken up the slack. The magazine motor is actually taking the tension of the film. Have a look at our loop size. There's a little line which is telling you where the loop should be and my loops are a little bit too big. So I'm going to push in to the sprocket wheel and reduce the size of those loops until they accurately conform to those loop indicator lines. Now I'm okay, I've loaded the camera really. But I need to check. I don't turn it on until I'm really certain that the camera is safely loaded. What I'm going to do is turn it over just a few frames, making sure that there's no resistance. That knob should turn very easily. If it suddenly jams on me, something's wrong and I need to take the film out and start again. That's okay. I've gone over a few frames. I can now run that camera and it will be safe. I'll show you something else. Back here, can you take the handle out? I have 
a zero indicated. That is the sign that the electronics think the camera's happy. If, for example, that buckle switch was incorrectly set and it felt there was a jam, that changes to a flashing B, indicating buckle switch trip, there's a misthread. Come back, reset the buckle switch, zero means that I can turn film safely. But you always turn over a few frames by hand to make sure and you always turn it in the direction of the arrow. Now to run the camera, there we go, that's the camera running. So if I close the door and run the camera, very quiet and the little beep tells us it's, it's come up to speed. So that is the basic load for this camera. Right, the electronic footage counter here, actually after loading it's indicating three feet. You always get a bit extra. So if we push this little button here, that will reset that counter back to zero. So we now have a counter which will count the feet of film as we go through the roll, so you know how much is left. Over here on the magazine, okay, we can count down. Now I've set that on these little buttons here to 999 feet. It's a thousand foot load, so I've set it to 999. When I run the camera, those numbers are push set will count down to zero. These numbers will count up to a thousand. So this tells me how much I've got left. This tells me how much I've shot. So I know to the foot how much film I've got left in that magazine. So that we know whether or not we need to change. Can we put, say, uh, the 40 millimeter on? We can put any lens on, of course. Standard PL mount, so to release, there we go, and we'll put this in the lens box. Okay, get your index marks. They're two little lines. You'll find them. That's right, they go just there. They, do, they go just there. Yep, and then operate your lock. Perfect. Perfect. That's your lens on. Now let's pop the mat box on. Or shall we do the follow focus? Let's do the follow focus. We might as well. We get the follow focus out. I'm going to show you get it. Ah. Somebody? It's the same as on the red. Same as on the red. We might want to put that. Yeah. Like so we just pop the follow focus on. Yeah. Is that that knob has to be done up good and tight at the bottom? Ah, we're a bit missing the gear, so you need to come back a bit with the yeah. follow. That's it. All the way back is the usual guide with this camera. Okay. Then lock him in. Perfect. <laughs> and then pop the mat box on. Then pop the mat box on. The red and the 35 have exactly the same image size. The, the sensor is the same size, whether it's a piece of film or the red sensor. So the lenses work the same. If you're using a 40 mil on the red, you'll use a 40 mil on this, and you'll get the same, the same image. Slowly. Yes, push it back until the donut meets the lens. Perfect. Okay, viewfinder. On this camera, we have a choice of two viewfinders. This is the short viewfinder when we want to be up 
here like this with the camera or we've got the camera on our shoulder we can change it for the long view finder now in order to do that all we have to do is a release catch just here if I pull that retract the pin and remove this one we can then swap it We'll swap it with this one. This allows you to stand a little bit further back from the camera and makes it a little bit more comfortable to operate. There's a little red dot just there and a little red dot on here. You have to line them up, go in, turn until it locks. Simple as that. Here, I'll show you, just under here, just there, there is a friction clamp, that knob there, that is really loose. If I do that up slightly, it stiffens, okay? Do it up a little more and it'll stay in place. When in doubt, put the short one on, but we'll leave it on the long one for now. So that's the viewfinder. This has a setting for anamorphic lenses. Mm. You know the cinemascope lenses? If I operate this lever into that position, it actually unsqueezes my anamorphic lens so I see a natural form. That's the position for spherical photography. When you look through here, the image might appear to be upside down because this is so complicated, this optics, it inverts the image compared with the other one. So if it's upside down, just rotate this knob and the whole image will pivot until you get it the right way up. And you can have it at any angle you want. There we are. Short-sighted like me, that's your diopter adjustment just there so that I can adjust that for my bad eyes you won't see that you'll be blurred to you because your eyes are normal mm -hmm. but my eyes need that adjustment my eyes too. also I want to do a critical focus okay and I haven't got a tape measure mm -hmm. that magnifies and zooms into the central part of the image like pushing the button two on the red yeah. exactly the same so I can get a critical focus and then come out again to frame and shoot. So that's the optical equivalent of pushing button two on the red. <coughs> Pure optical viewfinder system, of course, unlike the red, which is all electronic. So you get a very, very sharp, high quality image. So that's the viewfinder. I also have an assistant here which will give me glowing lines on the viewfinder image to help me frame in dark light conditions. And for that, I have to select different formats. There. I'll turn it off for now because we probably don't want it. We also have, by the way, a video assist. What we've done is we've connect the video assist to our external monitor I've also got this power cable coming into the camera. Now with these cameras, these cables are a danger because they can pull tight and cause damage to the sockets, which means sending the camera away for repair. So we always provide stress relief and we keep these releasable tie wraps in the camera case for this. You also need to do this with the red camera because the red camera is a lot more easily damaged than this one and the repairs are more expensive. So whenever I use this camera, I always have a, a free loop secured in case some, someone suddenly goes bonk, pulls it tight, no damage. That's a safety. We always do it with the red or with the, with the 35. That's standard procedure on set. Here we've got a PAL, which is the European standard for television, standard definition, video assist so that you can see on a TV set what, what's, what's going on in the viewfinder of the camera. Ooh. So, like, is that a lens flare? Mm -hmm. other things, okay. 
other things to explain to you. Watch what happens. Can you see when I cover and uncover that eyepiece with my hand on the video monitor you can see changes. Mm -hmm. There is a light path which comes not only through the lens but also through here. That's the reason why on these cameras you have like a light seal and your eye has to be like this. This is the way you operate a movie camera with your eye hard against that rubber gasket usually with a leather um, outer cover because you must stop light coming in here. If you're going to use the camera on a crane and use the video assist to actually frame then there is a special little shutter just here there's a little dial I turn that to close oh. I will now see nothing through there and it's protected <laughs> you know that's when I'm going to use the camera on a on a crane so other things other features at the moment we have a um, 185 stroke 235 uh, ground glass in the camera for framing and I'll show you that in a minute here I have the option of turning on a glow glowing lines around the frame for, for um, nighttime mm -hmm. conditions there you see it on, appear on the monitor back there mm -hmm. and I can change it to different ratios or turn it off mm -hmm. that just helps me when I'm shooting mm -hmm. in the dark I'm going to turn it off you can actually see on the monitor it's clearer in the viewfinder the inner lines are 235 the outer triangle the outer rectangle is 185 so it's a dual purpose ground glass that we've got in the camera so that's all set I'll put the viewfinder back in the normal position. Now I'm going to explain to you some things by actually looking in the front of this camera. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move the map box out of the way, disengage the follow focus. Can you pass me the uh, lens cover? I'll take the lens off for this because we need to see it. So standard PL mount Thank you. You can take the lens. Now, can you zoom in to see what's going on in here? In here, we have the rotating shutter and reflex viewfinder mechanism of the camera. As I turn that slowly, oh, that has exposed the film. You should now see the orange emulsion which is the actual film gate. With, with my, little, my little torch here, I can examine in there. Now, when the camera, you know, the director says, check the gate, oh. with the old style Panavision cameras, you pulled the gate out, look for dust, the gate is clear. The danger is when you pull the gate out, the dust falls out. Mm. And there was dust, dirt in the gate. With the movie cam, you take the lens off, look in there around the edges of that that is your actual film emulsion the gate is clear away you go and that's the the orange bit that we can yep. see this flat that's the actual there. film the actual piece of film being photographed you if you see a piece of dirt in there mm. then the previous exposure will have been damaged by that dirt and you need to reshoot immediately when the actors are still hot when i close the camera okay run the camera it will stop with the reflex viewfinder mirror sending the image from the lens to the viewfinder not to the film so that I can look through here with the camera off and frame if I want to see the film I don't open the back and inch it round by hand there's a little tiny button okay a little tiny button that I can actually use for dust checking. You might just see it there. It's called dust check. Where my finger's pointing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we come back and I push the dust check button, it exposes the film. The viewfinder goes blank. 
I come in, I check the gate, gate's clear, back we go. An easy way to check for dirt in the gate. You don't waste any film. You just take the lens out, mm. check, pop the lens back in. You should always do it because if there's dirt in the gate, you've got to reshoot and you don't know until the film comes back from developing, which won't be until the next day. Is that where you see sometimes in um, uh, rolls of film, you always see like a, somewhere this uh, part of the film is like washed, white washed out? I don't know. No. Or like if the film's exposed or something. No, no. Yeah? This is dirt in the gate. It okay. appears it's a black mark. Yeah, no, no. Usually poking down from the top. Okay. So you should never see it. You should, you yes, exactly. Yeah. You should never see it if the people have done their job right. You've seen the rotating shutter whizzing round. I'll just start and stop it so that the camera sees it. There it goes. What if I want to change my shutter angle? Let's say I'm shooting with an HMI and I want 172.8 degrees to be absolutely safe with a ballast a YWAN ballast HMI at 24 frames a second in the UK. First of all, to be safe, always, always unplug the camera. Because if I have this tool, it's called the combi tool, in that mechanism, and someone accidentally touches the run button, it could wreck the mechanism. Then, open up the camera, and I turn the camera until a little window appears at the bottom here. Let me tilt this and you might be able to see it on the video. I tilt that down. Just here, a little window has appeared. Let's just put a light in. There. The combi tool goes in there. You wiggle it and it engages a gear. I can now change my shutter angle and I'm going to set it at 172.8 degrees for wire wound HMIs. If I want to change it to any other value, hand turn the camera until the window appears, gently insert the combi tool with its gear, engage the gear and adjust the shutter. I can now check my ground glass. What I'm going to do is screw the combi tool into the holder for the ground glass and extract the ground glass. This is the thing you actually look at when you're looking through the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. That is the actual ground glass that you're looking at with the framing lines printed on it. Mm -hmm. You can change this for another ground glass if you want to shoot in another format. To insert it in the camera Again, if you have your puffer brush, and also, that you mustn't do on the red, only very gently. Film camera is much more robust, because they've got no delicate sensor in there, the red does. To put the ground glass in, push, disengage the combi tool, there we go, all done, put it back in its box. So that is setting your shutter angle for whatever you want. 180 is standard, 172.8, virtually the same but it gives you flicker free results with, it, with an HMI in the UK. If we were taking this camera to the United States, we'd set it at 180, of course. Mm. So that's easily done. Um, if we'd like to pop the lens back on, please. These little torches are invaluable for inspecting in these little chambers. Good housekeeping, we're always keeping our lens caps back in the lens box. 
Yeah, you're fine. You can engage that if you wish. What I suggest you do is give that a wiggle and with the other, no, the other hand just push it home. That's it. And then lock it with your lever there. Perfect. That's lovely. So we're all happy in here. The loops are the correct size. To remind you how to check a loop, turn the manual movement to a loop position, check top and bottom loop size. If they're incorrect, you push in the sprocket wheel, adjust, set it to the right size, release and give it a bit of a wiggle when you release it to make sure it's fully disengaged, a bit like the clutch of a car. Mm -hmm. Then when you run, the battery's out. out. Yes. Thank you. Let's pop the battery back in. There we are. Then when we run, we'll be happy. Close and lock. Light tight. Again, there's a very delicate seal around there which mustn't be damaged. So it's always closed gently and locked, never slammed shut. We film cameras because film is so sensitive to light, so easily damaged. What I have here is an accessory for the movie cam called a speed box. And this gives you additional electronic controls over the camera. To mount it, pull off that plate. Notice this goes to 1.0 frames per second and the camera will not run. If you suddenly come across a camera and it won't turn over, there's a good chance that that plate has been dislodged. If it says 1.0 there instead of 0, that's the fault indicator that the plate has been removed. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to engage, I'll take that out, because you never plug electronics in with the battery. I'm going to plug this in, in and then we'll plug in again okay now the speed box is alive what the speed box enables me to do is I can set one frame per second here which is currently set to 24 I can set another frame per second there which is currently 32 has anybody got a little cocktail stick or a match? Ah, fully equipped. <laughs> you, can tell, you can always tell the, the, the cameramen, they come, they come with all these little things. Let's set this to another value. I do that by simply pushing those buttons, but, but you have to use a little cocktail stick. Not a pin, cocktail stick. So I've set that to 42. That's my frame, second frame per second. Yeah. Okay. And here I've set a time. This is the number of seconds it's going to take to change between those two. So this is programmed for a ramp up. Again, I can set the time on that. It's going to take four seconds to ramp from 24 to 42 when I run the camera. So if I run the camera, comes up to speed, it's now going quickly. You see? I can run at different speeds. So that's what the speed box enables me to do. I can set it to run different frames per second, all kinds of nice things. I can also set the camera to run in reverse. Why would you do that? Ah, let's say I want to do an effect. Let's say I want to do a double exposure. Okay. You know, of a ghost. Mm -hmm. If I do an exposure of this background, don't move the camera, reverse to the beginning of the film by running backwards with the iris shut, mm -hmm. then do another exposure of a person walking across, they'll appear to be as a ghost. Okay. 
all kinds of in-camera effects enable me this is cooler than the digital yeah it can do fancy fancy things you can run forwards you can run reverse you can do all kinds of nice things there So again, the speed box gives you a lot of additional control. It's an option, you don't have to use it. For normal camera work you may decide not to use it. So that is the overview of the movie cam. But of course you're going to need to read that lovely big manual. These, this is a 16mm lens which is that much. The focal plane is actually about where my hand is, mm. far, far beyond 16 millimetres. They're what's known as retrofocal lens designs, and the back element pokes right out. The danger is when you put it in or take it out of the mount, you go, mm. that will smash the glass and ruin the lens. So they have to go straight in and straight out. There we go. So, pop the lens in. Exactly the same on the red, of course. The same danger on the red. You take the lens out, you knock it on the side of the mount, ruin the lens. It's a safety thing. You just have to get used to doing it. He's doing it. Perfect job. Nice and slow. There. So I'm going to just unlace this by releasing the film. It can be a little bit tricky to get out. Come, don't worry. Pull it to one side, like so. Then you get a good strong handle on here, good strong hand. Push the safety button, swivel the catch, push the catch, and the magazine will come away in your hand, like so. Then close. Can we put the plate back here, the dust plate? It's in the camera box. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there it is. Pop that back on. This will keep dust from entering the body. Dust is the enemy. Correct. Perfect. Now let's see what's going on in here. Let's open this up and see what's going on. So I've been shooting film, if I release and open my magazine, there, yeah. you see? That is exposed film on that side, this is um, film that uh, has yet to be exposed. So I'll wind some back. I'll wind some back. Do you have the thing where you lower the rebound? Yes, the changing bag. Yeah. Because this this you would never do, of course, because it'll all be over here, mm -hmm. and you just take it out and put it in the bag and then back in the uh, can. But do you have one? Oh, yes. yes. Yes, we have a change. It should be in there. There should be a big changing bag in there. I mean, we'll check that, we'll check that. We don't need it today, but if we were, if we were shooting live film, we'd need it. There is a dark room here, though, that we could use instead. So if you can see any light at all, the test for darkness is you go in, you sit there for 20 minutes in the dark. If you can see no light, it won't register on the film. If you can see light, then it's not dark enough. And it takes you 20 minutes for your eyes to get dark adapted. So you're forever doing this in new dark rooms. And for changing bag, you put a piece of unexposed film in the bag, leave it there for a while, develop it. If it's fogged, the bag's no good. You know? So it's, it's common sense stuff, really. Mm -hmm. By the way, this film, I'll show you, 
will tear really easily. It's designed to do that. So if there's a jam in the camera, the film breaks, not your £200,000 camera. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Print film for projectors is a different plastic and would wreck the camera. You must never ever load print film into a camera. You'll also see that the shape of the holes are different for cine film, for negative, than for the print. If you go and get a roll of print, there's some in there, you'll see that it's a different shaped hole. These are known as Bell and Howell perforations with curved sides. On the print film, it has straight sides, and those are known as Kodak perforations. So it wouldn't even fit, mm. and you'd wreck the camera. So here we have some print film to compare it with. And if you just compare this, A, I couldn't break that. Yeah. I couldn't tear it. But if you compare this, the shape of the holes, you'll see that they're slightly different. Mm -hmm. One is round, one is rectangular. That's Kodak, that's Bell & Howell. Bell & Howell were a very famous camera company from the you know, way, way back in the 1910s and 1920s, before Mitchell came along and took the business. Mm -hmm. 